coming off a weekend in which we expected to have some seriously competitive games in conference play. Mm -hmm. I was looking at Ohio State, Wisconsin. I was looking at Michigan State, Minnesota. Turns out neither of those games was very competitive. Yeah, actually, I think we learned quite a bit more about those teams because of the margin in them. Yeah, I think it's interesting. You've seen those, particularly those two teams, really do a great job of developing their program, and they are doing a great job recruiting, and it's showing up right now. Uh, I went to the Michigan State-Minnesota game this weekend. A lot of folks thought that would be a litmus test for both of these teams. Boy, did Minnesota look awfully good. And then, Nicole, by the time I got to sit down for dinner, it was about 45 minutes after Michigan State-Minnesota had ended, Ohio State-Wisconsin was all but over. Yeah, I think that was what was so interesting about that one and terrifying is how quickly that game got out of hand. In I mean, way. It, the, the, all those drives, they were yeah. so short. Yes, they were just dominant, different players involved. I mean. Yeah, I think it's really interesting the way Ohio State right now is playing, right? We've had all the questions on the defensive side. What would they be able to do? How are they going to figure this out? I think they're going to continue to get better. But when you look at them from an offensive standpoint, and Coach Dave took us through this a little bit a couple of weeks ago, talking about using other weapons. You'll see them now in two, with two backs using a fullback. You'll see them really use the tight end this past weekend. This is going to be a very tough team to defend for a lot of defenses because they can go in so many directions. And then you've got an elite quarterback with the elite wide receivers and the offensive line is doing a tremendous job. I think the question is what direction are they headed in when it comes to national rankings? And I know that national rankings don't mean as much in the world of the college football playoff committee, but everybody right. wants to be number one. And Ohio State is going to have to have a team above them lose to get to number one because the new AP poll looks a lot like the old <laughs> AP poll. And I'm not saying that Georgia and Alabama don't deserve to be one and two. They are right there. But the Buckeyes are going to need a little bit of help if they plan to get up into that one or two spot. You see no change at all yep. inside the top five. Georgia, Bama, OSU, Michigan, and Clemson. Penn State up three. Minnesota from the world of the unranked, now 4-0 to number 21. In my estimation, still not quite high enough for the Gophers, but P.J. Fleck and company will tell you they don't really care. So much more about Ohio State, and I understand that they're playing without Jackson Smith and Jigba, and they do this. <laughs> yeah. And I understand that C.J. Stroud and that ride-receiving group gets a lot of the attention, uh -huh. but to me, Howard, if this team is going to beat a Georgia, beat an Alabama, beat a Michigan, a physical team at the end of the year, yeah. It comes down to that offensive line, and I know they're explosive, but that run game to me for some reason continues to be underrated outside of their locker room where they know how important it is. Well, I, I think when you have the type of quarterback you have and you have those elite wide receivers, that's what's going to happen. People are not looking necessarily at the run game, and it is a dominant run game. They can run the ball with the best of them, but I think that also speaks to where we are in college yet college football right now. It's really about points. It's really about throwing the ball all over the field to score. So the running part of it is, is kind of, you know, not looked at as sexy, but it really is. It's a great job. I think about the way that people nationally talked about Michigan last year and when they really just wanted to run the ball and establish that. And when Harbaugh was comparing the ground attack to World War One and World War II, right? Like he was doing all of that and everyone wondered, can Michigan win a game in college football today? It's a, it's a similar question. But Ohio State has so many weapons in so many places. I think it's, it's natural that you are drawn to the big pass plays, but they have two great running backs, which is something I think we all came in expecting Trevian Henderson mm -hmm. to be like this. But Mayan, Mayan Williams has just been terrific. And I think having two 200-yard rushers in that game is something that is getting overlooked and doesn't deserve to be. Right. But, you know, th this is all just a luxury. I mean, this is just an embarrassment of riches because they have so many different people who can beat you. Yeah. Tony Alford has done an unbelievable job with that, with that running back room. And he's done it for years. And this is another assistant coach that doesn't get enough credit nationally for what he does and how he develops the players on the field and also how he develops them off the field. But he's, he said that this might be his most talented room. Mm. And think about, you know, the guys. Some pretty good <laughs> backs. Really good backs. Ezekiel Elliott wasn't bad. Carlos Hyde wasn't I mean, bad. Really, J.K. Dobbins wasn't bad. Yeah, but when you, he says the entire room, when you talk about that room, it's, um, you know, he's got a lot of players there, and they're guys that can't even get on the field. I love the fact that Nicole talks about the embarrassment of Richards because you ask about those offensive weapons, and even with Smith and Jigba out, you have the two running backs, you have Emeka Abuka, you have Marvin Harrison Jr. Cade Stover looked like George Kittle <laughs> yeah. on Saturday night, <laughs> oh, right? Boy. No one expected Cade Stover to be an offensive weapon, and the Badgers can't cover him. So I know it's more about Ohio State than it is about Wisconsin, but one quick thought on the Badgers before we move on. 
Very tough ask for Jim Leonard, and I think, honestly, the expectations were unfair this year for that Wisconsin defense. I'm not making excuses. Sure. They won't make excuses either. They lost eight starters mm -hmm. from that defense, including all Big Ten, all-American type talent. You are simply not going to reload when you lose that much talent on that side of the ball. I think one of the things that happens, and you really saw this when you saw Ohio State take advantage of that, right? You've got the running game. You've got the passing game. Oh, by the way, when have we ever seen Ohio State, you know, really since we've been covering them, feature a tight end in the passing game the way they feature? They've had talented tight ends for years there. But this was really the first time we saw them make a concerted effort to get the ball to the tight end. And that goes back to my statement earlier. This team's going to be hard to stop, so you have to pick your poison. Yeah, and also, again, you know, we've, we've talked so much about Graham Mertz and this mm -hmm. Wisconsin offense. Um, I mean, you know, they can't, they can't make up ground like that. They yeah. can't score in bunches like yeah. that. They can't play from behind like that. Um, so all of that was confirmed as well. So I think the margin may have been a little bit surprising to folks, though no one overly shocked that Ohio State is unbeaten at this point in the season. I think the margin in the other game that I started this show talking about was a little more surprising to folks in that game being the Michigan State Minnesota matchup 34 to 7 and you can make the argument it wasn't that close the Spartans scored late against a second string Minnesota defense we talk about Ryan Day's play calling at Ohio State and how good it is <laughs> I have to tip my cap to Kirk Shiraka and that offensive staff because they went into this game with everybody talking about how Minnesota grounds and pounds and Mo Ibrahim. They used the pass to set up the run, and Tanner Morgan was throwing the ball into windows about this big. Ten different receivers yeah. caught passes. Minnesota's offense looks like that. I don't know that anybody can stop them in the West. No, I think they're definitely the favorites. I think they're the clear favorites in the West coming out of this. But also, this is the Tanner Morgan that Kirk Soraka yes. led yeah, a couple years ago. Yeah. All of those records about efficiency and accuracy. I mean, when you have the same amount of touchdown throws as you do in completions, it's a pretty good day. <laughs> he really did. And I know we talk about this offense and just how good they are. Defensively, they are playing so well on that side of the ball. This is, I mean, he's doing a, an unbelievable coaching job this year. Um, and he's developed this team. And when you go to a practice, it's like no one else's practice. It's, you know, they're concise. They really go through everything. They go through such situational football all the time. So now you see him. And then think about the offensive linemen. They lost four of them last year. And this offensive line this year, I mean, they're rolling. But when you can throw the ball around the way they are right now with the consistency that Tanner Morgan is playing with, yeah, it's no doubt they're, they're the best team in the West without a question. Right after Chris Ottman Bell's yes. injury. Yeah, I mean, your like, best wide receiver is gone. Yeah. For the right, year. And, and you put up those numbers. This is like last year when they would lose running backs and they were having all this these injuries at that position. And still, the next running back was able to put up big numbers. Yeah. I mean, this program can really replace and replenish really well. And, and Tanner Morgan just can build that chemistry with a lot of different receivers. It is so reminiscent of 2019. I think one of the other keys to that, too, is you have to be able to develop your players, your, your second team, 13 guys, to be able to have that success. And it is clear. And, and sometimes in places, that third guy or that second guy may not be as engaged yeah. as you would need him to be when someone goes down. So then there's a little lull. You don't have that. And to me, that it goes back to the coaching staff, really getting these guys prepared and having people dialed in every day at practice. It, it's not an easy thing to do to be a backup, but their backups – understand that you know we could be playing right now and they play like they don't play like backups when they get their opportunity well pj fleck talks all the time about the fact that the great teams are player led teams yeah you have tanner morgan and oh by the way you have mo ibrahim who went over 100 yards for the 13th <laughs> consecutive game right. in that backfield you have a couple of guys in their mid-20s mm -hmm. right one's married i mean these yeah. are true men yeah. they are leading this team i'm telling you Minnesota is really scary. You start to look at their schedule. You look at the crossovers. They've already played one against Michigan State. The other tough one is Penn against State. Penn State. Yeah. Rutgers also on that crossover schedule. You mentioned favorite. I think you can make the argument they're a monster favorite yeah. right now in the West. Yep. Maybe the biggest favorite in the division because, of course, Ohio State will have to deal with Michigan at some point. Speaking of Michigan, we expected the Wolverines to have by far their toughest test to date with Maryland. They did. Mm -hmm. Terp scored 27 but you want to discuss run games. Blake Corm <laughs> did not come into this year as one of the more highly touted running backs nationally. A lot of folks kind of forgot about his talent. He was banged up late mm -hmm. in the year last year. He goes for more than 240 on 30 carries. Noah Hassan Haskins, 
no worries. This run game can do it for Michigan. Well, I think a little bit last year was like it was this like thunder and lightning thing. They, they were two different running backs. and They complemented each other so well, and they were both really good. And so we kind of talked about them together. But now I think Blake Corum, if Michigan keeps winning, is going to have a potential Heisman case. I mean, that's the kind of numbers he's putting up through a couple of weeks. It's a good thing they have him because the rest of that game went exactly like I anticipated, <laughs> where Maryland's offense was able to do stuff. They Even after I've never seen someone score three seconds into a game, Maryland responded really well to that. But it was sort of that back-and-forth shootout vibe that I thought was going to come. And then to have Blake Corm do what he did to get you the win, I think, was just so, so important for Michigan. I think those 30 carries really is impressive. I'm with you on that. It, it really is and he came into the season 12 pounds heavier uh not fat at all but put that extra 12 pounds on any shows and to me the other thing that stood out in this game is his ability to play without the football so whether he's blocking he's a willing blocker he's going to do that he's going to go downfield and block for his wide receivers if he has that opportunity he's picking up blocks uh defensive linemen he's helping in that area he's carrying out his fakes which sometimes you know, good running backs don't like to do, but he's carrying out his fakes. He's playing as well as anybody I've seen in a long time play without the football. So now on the other side of the ball, the question becomes, was this more about what Maryland could do offensively because they are a very explosive offensive team, or are there any concerns with Michigan defensively? This is the first really good offense that we saw Michigan face under the new era. No Mike McDonald, a mm -hmm. couple of important starters, obviously. Top two draft pick and two <laughs> guys in the first round taken a year ago. So... Any questions there, or do we just simply say, you know what, Maryland's offense is really good, no issues with Michigan's. State. I don't have any issues with it. I mean, people might have issues because they're, they're not that dominant defensive end that's out there, but that's okay. To me, this is still a better defense, and they're going to have games like that. They're playing against an explosive Maryland team who has a lot of weapons, and now they've gotten that run game going, Maryland has, so it's going to be tough to try to slow this team down. So I'm not concerned. I think to me it speaks to just how far Maryland has come as a program, particularly on, on the offensive side, and really defensively, more so than the offense. I agree. I, I think it's more about Maryland. I think we were really excited about that offense coming in top 15 passing efficiency. If guys can stay healthy throughout the season, like they're going to put up numbers on on everybody. And so I, I I'm also going to reserve my judgment yeah. on the Michigan defense because we also knew it was going to take some time for them to plug and figure out how they were going to yeah. do it or get pressure on quarterbacks without Eden Hutchinson and David Ojabo. So I think we'll just learn more about them in the coming weeks yeah. and, and we go from there. But also I, I'll tell you this against Iowa's offense. They're going to have. I think a more successful day next week. <laughs> I think that's a fair statement. <laughs> that's fair. That's fair. We'll see. I think you also need to take a closer look at Maryland's schedule. We were just discussing this before we started the show. The Terps are going to likely be favored in their next four games. So if you do the numbers, and I'm not a math major, but three mm -hmm. plus four does equal seven, could you be looking at a seven and one Maryland team? I know Michael Oxy does not want his team right. to even start to think about that. But that is definitely in the realm of possibility before Maryland hits a really tough stretch in the last month. I, I think when you when we talk about Maryland, it's about making that next jump, right? You got to be able to win these games, right? You can't have letdowns after after a Michigan game. You have to go out and play, be dominant the, the way you can be. And I think that's one of the things they have to take that next step, and we'll see. And one of the next steps was to play a team like Michigan more competitively yeah. than they did in the past, which they mm -hmm. did. They did. They did. I agree. So we're ready to see. We, we all agree. It's a good football team. I still think they're a really good football team. I want to see how they respond in this next game. All right. Volleyball, the Purdue Boilermakers are rolling, knocking off Iowa in Iowa City Sunday. That was two days after they swept eighth-ranked Minnesota in the Big Ten opener. Purdue has won five straight. Boilers are at 11-1 and one on the season. And with that knowledge in hand, we welcome in Boilermaker head coach Dave Shondell to the show. Dave, first and foremost, thanks so much for the time. I'm sure you guys had a wonderful weekend after those two results. Well, we're feeling pretty good. It was a, a short weekend. Uh, by the time we got back from Iowa City, it was time to get uh, busy with Illinois, who we play on Friday. But uh, our kids are playing really, really well, Rick. I'm so excited and so proud of this young team and, and how we're responding to, to now the pressure of playing in Big Ten. Dave, it's an easy question to ask, probably a hard one to answer because I know your team is doing a lot of things well right now. What's the best thing that your team did over this past weekend? Well, I just think our ball control is, is playing at a very high level right now. Even, even on Sunday, we played without our libero. Matty Skimmerhorn was out, 
and yet we filled that gap. We have uh, really four outstanding passers, defenders, and uh, if you don't have those people getting the job done, you really can't run your offense. But I think that we're getting great leadership. We have two transfers that came in, Grace Valenciefer, who set that match against Minnesota on Friday, and Hannah Clayton, who came in from Iowa. And, uh, and they're just providing this, this great maturity and this great leadership that's made a big difference on a team that has very few people that have played in big time matches before this year. That win over Minnesota, Dave, it was a sweep, but it was oh so close. You had to come back in the first two sets. That third set was the longest set any Purdue team has played in five years. You had 21 ties, five match points. What was it like to have a front row seat for that set and that match? <laughs> Yeah, it didn't feel like a sweep. Uh, it felt like it was an absolute brouhaha in there that night. And uh, the crowd was electric. Uh, you know, we always have great crowds, but when you can put that kind of a product on the floor, people come to life that uh, normally don't do that in the stands. So it was a lot of fun. But, um, you know, we did not feel like we could go. We had the ability at this point in the season to sweep Minnesota. So to do that was, was pretty special. Uh, we felt like we had a match in us that could, could win against a team that has the kind of talent that Hugh McCutcheon has this year and every year. Uh, but our, our guys just were brilliant. Uh, you know, that we had a defensive game plan that we thought would be fairly effective. And, uh, and it's, it's easy to have the game plan, Rick, but when your players execute the plan, it's a pretty neat thing to watch. And, and that was my perspective, was to sit back and just watch our players follow a game plan, compete, um, you know, really in, in their first Big Ten match of their career for a lot of these players. In this league, Dave, Dave, when you do have to go on the road and you have to play at places like Nebraska, Penn State, Minnesota, so many others, Wisconsin, how important, how critical <laughs> is it for you to protect your home court when you have those opportunities? Well, you know, when you have a special place like we do, Holloway Gym and even your own staff has called it the toughest place to play in the Big Ten Conference. So you have to use that to your advantage. And we've been really good. We've been beating top 10 teams here on a regular basis for the past several seasons. So you have to get those, but that doesn't mean you can let up when you go on the road. And places like Iowa, even though that they're not picked to finish in the upper half of the league this season, boy, Jim Barnes is doing a tremendous job with the Hawkeyes. And, and they've got a great place to play right now. The Extreme Arena is a fun place to go into. And, and when we go on the road, we really work hard to sell to our players that this is going to be a great experience. Don't go in there thinking that this is going to be tough or it's going to be intimidating. You have to walk in from the time we practice the day before to when we arrive for serve and pass during that, that day of the competition. We want to embrace that. We want to, be, we want to greet the people that are greeting, you know, that meet us at the door, and we want to look at all the positives about playing no matter where we're going in this Big Ten Conference. Dave, you mentioned a couple of your new players. You have some transfers. You lost some real talented players over the last couple of years. So at what point did you realize that this particular group had the ability to do what it did on Friday night? Well, we felt like we had a good spring. You know, volleyball has an opportunity to play four matches during the spring. And, and we saw some of these... The, we don't have a lot of playing experience in matches, but we have a lot of players that have been in our program for a long time, just you know, chomping at the bit for these guys to leave ahead of them so they could get on the floor a little bit. But I'd say when Eva Hudson arrived uh, this fall and we got a chance to see the, the freshman phenom play and what she brings to our team, aside from being just a great athlete that can you know, put balls away and can block and serve and play defense, she brings this incredible toughness to this team. And not that we didn't have some toughness, but she just really embellishes that. And if you're going to compete in the, the best conference in the country, you better have some tough customers on your team, and she certainly is one of them. Dave, I'd love to talk women's college volleyball as a whole with you for a minute because the popularity of this sport seems right now to be on such an upward trajectory. We are talking about setting new attendance records each and every weekend, 16, 17,000 more popularity with youth than we've ever seen before. My 12-year-old my daughter just started this year. Why do you think the awesome. sport seems to be exploding at this moment? Well, a couple of things, Rick. One, social media. Uh, you know, volleyball is one of those sports that the media hasn't really embraced until late. And uh, a, lot of, a lot of that is because there are a lot of people who didn't know much about volleyball. Uh, I grew up in the sport of volleyball. My dad was the men's coach at Ball State University. He's a pioneer in the sport of volleyball. So I've, it hasn't been a secret to me. But now that all these TV networks, including the Big Ten Network, which is the, you know, broke all the, 
broke everybody in with and is doing such a great job that now people across the country are seeing volleyball played and now as you mentioned most popular sport for women in the country in, in high school and now boys volleyball is blowing up at, at the same time i just think they're actually seeing it for the first time and we still don't get a lot of publicity uh you know in media but we can make our own publicity by using our social media. I, I love to get on social media and help people understand what a great sport we have and, and what our program is doing here at Purdue. So I think social media and then these, you know, you know more TV has uh, had a big impact on, um, on volleyball across the country. Outside of just the popularity, Dave, what's been the biggest change? You're now in your 20th season in West Lafayette. What's been the biggest change, whether it's within the sport itself, whether it's within the players, whether it's anything on the outside from the time that you started as the head coach of the Boilers to right now? The athleticism on the floor. And, you know, one of the benefits of, of, of our GM, Rick, is everybody comes in on floor level. So every fan walks in to go to their seat on the floor level and they walk right by either the players on our team or the players on the other teams that are warming up. And they just have to be impressed with the size, the physicality, the athleticism that these players have. And then you don't go any higher in our gym except about 15, 16 rows. So there's a, everywhere you sit in Holloway Gym is a great seat. So you're watching these players right in front of you jumping out of the gym. You know, even on our own team, we have 11 players that are touching can jump touch above a basketball rim and so the size look at the match that was on last night between Minnesota and Wisconsin on your network and the, just the size and the physicality and how hard they hit the ball and how hard they compete that was a great match even though it was a sweep it didn't feel like it you know last night up at uh, Minnesota I just think that the athleticism is just off the chart and a lot of players that were choosing other sports maybe 10 15 years ago are falling in love with volleyball now so now we've got everybody that just loves to play this game and it's become the favorite sport for women across the, the, the world and the country. All right, Dave, as you start to look ahead to the rest of your season, you mentioned you have Illinois, another tough one this weekend, then you come back home against Rutgers. You want the team to enjoy their success. You want the team to feel confident, but you never want the team to look past any opponent, not in this league. What sort of message do you feel like you have to send as you're at this point in the season with so much of conference play still left on the plate? Well, I, I just remind him, Rick, that, that I've been here for a while and I know what it's like. You have to trust me, the experience of, of like yesterday going to Iowa, it was going to be a street fight. And I told him that from the very beginning. If you think this is going to be a walk in the park, you're crazy because I've been doing this for 20 years in this league and it's never been a walk in the park to go to Iowa. And I can tell you when we go to Huff Hall at Illinois and they're 2-0 and in the season and they're, they're a big physical outfit, that if you're not prepared to play, you will get beat. And we come back and we play Rutgers, which we don't talk about until after we get done with Illinois, but Rutgers will be the same thing. They're just dying for a chance to make some noise. And they beat Michigan State last uh, Sunday. So I just try to impose upon them their trust in me and our staff and the veteran players that have been through this a, a few times, that there's no easy night in the Big Ten. And the way you're successful is you load it up every night and you're ready to play. Well, getting ready to play at Illinois Huff Hall on Friday, and the Boilermakers are back home on Sunday against Rutgers. You can see both those games on Big Ten Plus. Boilermaker head coach Dave Shondell. Dave, congrats on a great start to Big Ten play. Wish you the best of luck the rest of the season. And as always, we appreciate your time here on Big Ten today. Thanks, Rick, and a lot of volleyball to be played. We appreciate what you guys are doing for our sport at the Big Ten Network. Thank you. Today's big stat brought to you by Gatorade. There was so much talk about the Penn State defense before the year started because Manny Diaz was coming in as the new D.C. Sean Clifford and those freshman running backs say, hold on a second, what about the offense? Because this Penn State O has scored 30 points in his first four games of the season. It's only happened five times in the last 40 years and only twice in the past 15 years. Thank you, Nicholas Singleton and Katron Allen. And with that, it is time for Overreaction Monday. Rick Pizzo back with Nicole Auerbach and Howard Griffith. We start with Penn State, and the overreaction after Penn State's 4-0 start, to me, would be pretty simple. It would be that Penn State is now on the same level as Ohio State and Michigan and on even footing to win the Big Ten East. Okay, I don't know if I'm going to go that far, but that is the knee-jerk Monday reaction to this. I think that the more interesting piece here is just that they are a contender. I think that's a more realistic, and that's where I'm willing to go. I mean, I feel like we've had to reset our expectations for what Penn State is yeah. and who they can be 
based on the fact that they do have a run game, that they do have a great defense. But we have been waiting yes. for Penn State <laughs> to have an explosive running back since Saquon Barkley. Mm -hmm. We've been waiting for them to have that factor to loosen things up for Sean Clifford in the past game. They have all of that. So I do think they're going to factor in in the East. I, I really do. Yeah, I think they're in the mix, right? I'm not willing to take that next step yet because I think – each and every week, there's going to be something else I would need to be able to see. Last week, how do they respond after a big road victory? They did a great job. Really step. So now, again, they have to continue to play at that level. They've shown that they can do it. So now, these games that they need to win, they have to go out and win those games each and every week. But this is as talented a team as we have in, in the conference. When you start to look at, you look at recruiting rankings, you watch the film and see just how fast they are. This is a really talented team. They just have to stay consistent and keep winning football games. Well, they also have to play well against the Ohio States. And that's been – like, every time we get excited about this Penn State teams in recent years, they go into that game and we see that there's still that gap. And from a talent perspective, there shouldn't be as much of a gap, right? The development, all that stuff should be there. And maybe because we are learning so much about this Penn State and we are watching them grow, we are seeing them address those deficiencies over the years, maybe that will go different. But until we see that, like, yeah. that's the measuring stick. Well, we and have seen that in the past. Now, we haven't seen it the last couple of years, right. but there was a four-year stretch in which those teams battled yes. back and yeah. forth and played some amazing games. Of course, the blocked field goal that led to the Penn State win. They've proven they can do yeah. it. You say they have an explosive run back, running back for the first time since Saquon Barkley. I say they have two mm -hmm. because I think Catron Allen, and I know yeah. Nicholas Singleton is yeah. going to be the star, but these are two backs, Howard, who have grabbed everybody's attention, not just in the Big Ten, they are national names. Nicholas Singleton started to become a nationally known freshman. And for good reason. I mean, the explosiveness he has, the way he plays, uh, with, runs the ball with patience, the vision he has. He's a home run threat. Both of these guys are. And we saw you know, them use him in two different ways last week. And, and I think it's going to continue to get better. And this has to get some credit as well, is the offensive line. They're, they are much better than we've seen them. They're playing much better than we've seen them play in recent years. And what I like about Nichols, Nicholas Singleton is he's one of those players where it looks like he's on fast forward and everyone <laughs> else is playing at a different speed. Like, he really has that speed. And I, I love watching those yeah. guys. Those are game breakers. It pushes that turbo button. It's, it's good to see James Franklin and Mike Yurcich said over and over again, we are going to focus on improving our run game yes. before 2022. Mm -hmm. They are doing exactly that, and it's exactly what Penn State's offense seems to need. Iowa's offense finally got what it needed, um, at least a little bit, against Rutgers. I mean, 27 yeah. points, and I know they got some help from the defense, mm -hmm. but 27 points are pretty good output for this team based on what we've seen so far this year. So the overreaction would be to say – Iowa's offensive issues have been fixed. Well, I, I think Iowa, if, if you're an Iowa fan, you should be happy that they found a way to score some points. The defense uh, put them in good position as well. But I, I still think they have issues there. I mean, they have to figure it out. But it's about winning games, and they find ways to win. And I think at the end of the day, that's where it is. But I don't think the offensive issues have necessarily been fixed. Oh, I, I don't either. I think the defense is really helping them. And we've, we've joked about this, right, of like, you know, coming off of safeties out of week one. Can they keep yeah. scoring? And obviously they're able to score in a way that other defenses can't. And that positions them really well. They also tend to have good field position. But I, I do think, you know, all the concerns about are they going to be able to put up points in games where points are at a premium, it, it is going to be a question that's going to follow this team. I think, too, some of the play calls on, like, long third downs where they didn't really go – near the near the first down marker mm -hmm. uh, you know you have some questions about things like that it has made it a difference as they've gotten healthier at receiver yeah. we have seen those things but again if the defense doesn't score can they put up enough points offensively I don't know well they need Keegan Johnson to be healthy they need Sam Laporta to be one of the best tight ends in the country yep. which he has which shown he the ability mm -hmm. yeah. to do but somebody has to get him the ball yep. they need to be able to run the ball I would just counter anybody who's negative about Iowa right now by going back and looking at what they've done in the past 15 years under Kirk Ferentz, yes, the word, they, they get better throughout the season. I know everybody says that, but it's units that get better. This yeah. offensive line is not a very experienced offensive line, especially in the middle. They lost the best center in college football in Tyler Linderbaum. Yeah. They will get better as the year goes on, and when they get better, Iowa can get back to playing the kind of football that it wants. Mm -hmm. It does not want to throw the ball. If Spencer no. Peters has to throw the ball 25, 30 oh, times, yeah. Iowa's in trouble. Yeah, that's not who they are. That's not their DNA. And, and I think what we get caught up in sometimes is what we see from other teams across the country, throwing the ball around, having the explosive plays, 
That's not who they are. They've never been that way. And, and, and that's okay because they've had success playing the game the way they've been playing in recent years. So you know, it's just we just have to adjust what our expectations are for the offense. At the end of the day, we know what kind of coaching coach he is. Coach Ferentz is, is an unbelievable coach. His record speaks for itself. But we just have to adjust the way we look at them and the way they want to play the game. I think, and, and to your point about improvements through the season, I mean, they just need to be a little bit better. They need to be a bit, maybe a bit better, but they need to get to what is, you know, like FBS average on these things in terms of how they move the ball, how the points that they put up. Because their defense is doing plenty. They're, the special team's doing plenty. They're dominating in those two phases. So they just need a little more help from that offense, and they're going to win games that way. And there are other offenses inside the Big Ten West where they they will play the majority of their games that are also struggling. So mm -hmm. those matchups, now, they're not going to match up very well against Ohio State. Tell me who is. Right. They're not going to match up very well against teams like Maryland that can throw it all over the yard unless they get pressure on Tua because Maryland's going to score. Not a lot of teams match up well there. Tell Lee, I apologize. I was watching the NFL over the past <laughs> weekend as well. But in those matchups in which they're playing other teams that have similar DNAs, Iowa does that as well, if not yeah. better, than anybody else in the nation because they've done it for so long under Kirk Ferentz. All right, last overreaction Monday topic, and I don't think that this one is at all an overreaction okay. because I think based on what Ohio State did against Wisconsin, based on how they started the year against Notre Dame, and based on what we've seen from their defense, I think they are equally labeled, or at least should be, as national championship favorites along with Georgia and Alabama. I don't think they're even one iota or inch behind either one of those teams. Yeah, I think it just depends upon where you are in the country and who you get a better chance of watching each and every Saturday will determine that. But absolutely, they're a contender. They're right there in the mix. Now, whether they can get to the one spot, the two spot, as you mentioned earlier, they're going to need some help because I think the perception is that those two teams in front of them right now aren't going anywhere. So I think you know they'll end up playing each other most likely. So this Ohio State team has just shown the ability to, to continue to play well. And we talk about the offense. The defense is what's going to continue to get better. I agree. Uh, and yeah. that's – they've got the players there to make that happen. So, I don't think it's an overreaction at all. This team is really, really good. Here, I'll even tweak that. I think that they're – up there with Georgia. I don't even know that Alabama mm. is up there because of the way that they played against Texas yeah. and the fact that Texas was the better team and it should have been a loss on their resume. I don't know if this Alabama team is the Alabama teams we usually pencil in. They had close calls last year, including a game against a Florida team that ended up firing their coach. It feels like it's one of those teams they don't have that first round NFL talent at receiver. So I think they're going to struggle a little bit more than the way we're going to see Georgia and Ohio State when they play down the stretch. And, and I think that you could absolutely put Ohio State up there. Georgia's offense, fun, explosive. Ohio State's offense, fun, explosive. And we're watching these defenses come up to speed, get better in real time. So I think it's those two and their separation. That's an interesting point. Alabama did struggle, didn't look great at all in that Texas game, really got away with that. Ryan Day, everybody knows what a great play caller he is, and I thought his play calling against Wisconsin was phenomenal. And he's usually an intense guy. But as I was watching that game on Saturday night, he had the eye of the tiger. He looked like a guy who understands what he has. I mean, it was 28-0 in a heartbeat, and he was still on the sidelines, pacing up and down, wearing out the officials. I wonder if he knows in the back of his mind, every coach has that sense and that feel of a team that we don't know because of what he sees chemistry-wise in the locker room. I get the sense that Dave feels like this team is specifically special. Well, that's when you see those 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 tells. It's kind of like when when Nick Saban tees off on his team, and and you can tell it's either because it's a championship caliber team or because like this year they actually have problems mm -hmm. and he needs to fix things. It, it's one of those, right? Where you you got to kind of read where the coach is. Michigan and, and Ohio State too is in a situation where like we learned against uh, in Notre Dame how tough they were and that mm -hmm. they could win a game with toughness. They learned about the run game in that game. This one was. The explosiveness, putting a game away basically halfway through the first quarter. And it was just how quick, the quick strikes and how lethal that offense was so quickly. I think we're, we're seeing different facets of that offense in, in different ways. We've seen them go out of the I formation, too. Mm -hmm. That was fun. So I think he's having fun with that while building that up and knowing, you know, okay, we're going to be pretty good in all of our games. And then in a couple times, we'll, we'll test our defense and learn about them. And I think one of the things they're doing well is they're playing a lot of people. They're playing a lot of people, and to me, that is invaluable when you can have that many athletes and you're able to get them in 
and get them valuable minutes in, in games. But it, I go back to this, and, and he's just able to call games differently each and every week. And Coach Wilson is there as well up in the booth. They do a really good job of figuring out, okay, we need to attack this team this way, right? We're going to attack them this way. We need to take exactly – what they're giving us. CJ did an unbelievable job to me when you go back to the Notre Dame game because he took all the underneath stuff. He never got in a situation where he started to press. And then when he needed to make the play, he made the play. So the coaching staff is doing an unbelievable job, but these players are responding to what they're being asked to do. And that is huge. And I think the way this is starting to shape up, the coaching job uh, that Ryan Day is doing and his staff is, is pretty remarkable and pretty special, even though they have probably one of the most talented teams in all of college football. You remember just a couple of years ago when folks were like, really, is, is Ryan Day, is he ready? Is he ready to take over an Ohio State program? And Urban said, this guy's a rock star. He's good. He, and be, ah, really? Yes, really. And you yeah. know the challenge to that? I mean, there weren't a few programs in college football that it's national championship above. That's it. Yep. This is about winning championships. It's not about getting to the Big Ten championship and winning that game. I know that's what you need to do on the way, but make no mistake about it. It's about playing in the college football playoffs and winning that game. The ring is the thing. No doubt.